So we'll be chairing, we'll be chairing this uh, gecko session today. This is the gecko endoscopy session, and um, I'd just like to um, acknowledge that uh, this is in conjunction with the University of New Mexico Echo Program, and with our own uh, gecko um, element uh, organised through them, and. I'm pleased to say that we have 72 registrations for today's meeting um, from 13 countries, including Peru. So obviously, word has spread that there might be some knowledge base in the, the African continent that could be of value. And otherwise, we've got Ethiopia, Ghana, Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. So welcome to all the participating uh, individuals. And again, please um, post your questions in the chat box. Um, today, uh, we are going to talk about two uh, aspects that are interrelated. Um, one is necessary for the other, and one has more application than the other. But first up is uh, Dr. Sasa Bota. I had the privilege of uh, supervising her masters in, the, in manometry at the other end of the, the uh, GI tract. But she's uh, definitely a, an expert and a well-educated expert on the subject. And she runs the um, manometry laboratory here at Grutescure and uh, at Tigerberg and um, organizes our esophageal meetings um, until she... Uh, had to get her back straightened out. But anyway, that's enough of that. And we'd like you to uh, listen to, to her um, and also to um, post your questions in chat so that we can um, see where we are and how, uh, how uh, you can interact with, with Sasa about some practical aspects of, of manometry. Over to you, Sasa, you can go and share your screen. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been asked to talk about the ABC of high resolution pressure topography manometry. Uh, my aim of my talk is please not to confuse you. Um, I'm going to discuss the history of the development of manometry, paradigm shift of the classifications, high resolution manometry metrics and the high resolution manometry images of motility disorders using the Chicago classification version four, the indications for high resolution manometry and a take home message. So a historical perspective in short was that they actually started studying the motility in 1877, Ardloing, and then later in 1883, they started using um, air filled balloons, but you can see the contraption they actually used, but they actually did get linear um, tracings by using this um, system. In 1940, Ingelfinger and Abbott started using water perfused balloons um, for catheters, and in the 1950s, uh, they started, they developed water perfused catheters with side ports. And that was all to try and understand the physiology and pathophysiology of the esophagus. Later in the 1950s, the Ardendorf Low Compliance Newer Hydraulic Perfusion System with water perfused catheters with four to six side holes, five centimeters apart, were introduced. And I've been in the trade so long, I actually started with the Ardendorf um, uh, perfusion pump, and we actually still used uh, DOS as, this, as the software. Um, so the pressures were depicted as linear tracings and they used a pull through protocol also developed in 1956 by Fike et al. And this was known for many years as conventional manometry. More advanced conventional manometry systems developed as the computer software became more sophisticated. In 1990, high resolution manometry was developed by Klaus and Staniano. Oops, let's go back one, sorry. Don't want to go back. 
Huh? That's good. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they became more sophisticated. Um, so the high resolution started in 1990, and that only meant that there were actually more channels on each catheter. Oh, it keeps on jumping there. Mm -hmm. um, so high resolution just means more cath more more spaces, um, more channels, but you still had the linear the the, the linear um, um, tracings. So in 1991, Ray class replaced these special levels. Um, to create isobaric contour plots, very much like a weather chart. Weather chart. So the, the higher the pressure, the warmer the color. And it also gave a kind of a three-dimensional feel to it. And what you must realize is that what you see actually is happening at that moment in the, in the esophagus. So currently we use two systems. The one is the water perfuse system, the one that we use. And then you've also... Uh, the difference between and the other one is the solid state. The difference is the, the pressure transducers for the water system is external, whereas the pressure um, uh, systems are, are within the catheter for the solid state system. So you can see how it progressed from only four to six channels to uh, 36 linear to uh, isobaric contour plots over the years. So with the development of uh, the software, of course, a paradigm shift of classifications for motility disorders also occurred. So we started off in the 80s um, with the Castell classification, and they, so he sort of grouped it between pressure and, and bolus movement. But in, in 2012, we, we, uh, they actually started in 2009 with the first concept of the Chicago classification, but only in 2012, they had a consensus meeting where they actually um, sort of uh, um, it demonstrated the, the version two classification. Um, it, was, it was difficult to sort of um, grasp and, and actually, you know, I, yeah, we really struggled to actually find it useful um, to try and come to a motility disorder diagnosis. So luckily in 2004, 2014, we had another, um, the second Ascona meeting, and they then had the Chicago version three, which I really enjoyed. I found it very practical because they, they sort of grouped the outflow, um, OGJ outflow obstruction um, as one group, so your achalasias and your outflow obstruction. And then they had the major motility disorders, and then they had the um, minor motility disorders. Then, and it really functioned well, but it sort of left a little bit of a gap for your outflow obstruction or sort of your, your variant of achalasias or your evolving achalasias. So they again had 52 delegates um, it's the working group, the interest group, and they got together again, and we were supposed to have our third Ascona meeting uh, in 2020, but then it had to be postponed because of COVID. So then they now have got this new classification, um, Chicago version 4. I personally think that they'll probably have another meeting again and probably change it again, because this one sort of is a bit complicated. Um, I just wanted to give a sort of an idea of the, the relationship where your catheter lies once you've introduced it. Um, you actually you, you sort of um, have your catheter right in the, in, the, in the stomach and then you can see the, the, the aortic arch is quite prominent. So you sometimes get that as a sort of a um, um, defect on your, on your tracing, the pressure of the, of the arch. And on this side, you can see you've got your, you've clearly got your um, diaphragm as well as your internal um, sphincter. I'm not going to go into innovation because that's rather complicated, but you've just got to know you've got excitatory uh, stimuli and you've got inhibitory stimuli. It's important to realize that the peristalsis, there must be progression um, to, to, to be normal. And you must always remember that the bolus moves because you've got a contraction behind the bolus, let's say water or solid, and in front of it, you've got relaxation of your esophagus. And that's how your bolus moves forward. So a wet swallow, when you look at your wet swallow of high resolution manometry, as I said, it is 
in time. So it's exactly what it looks like, um, what's actually happening in the esophagus at that moment. And as I said, higher colors, um, of higher pressures of, of warmer colors. So you can clearly see here, we've got, we've got a, a pressure bar up here and we've got another pressure bar down here. So that represents your upper sphincter and this one, your lower sphincter. In the middle, you've got your, your striated muscle and then you've got a you've got a um, um, a gap, and that is sort of the transitional zone where your striated muscle goes into your smooth muscle that you find in the body of your um, esophagus. If you want to try and uh, sort of like we do have webinars from different countries, you've all got to speak the same language. Otherwise, you can't compare apples to apples. So it's very important that you know the language of high resolution monometry. And it's actually just five, the vocabulary is only consists of five. Um, so the first is the integrated relaxation pressure. I will go into everyone in detail just now. We've got the distal contractile integral, contractile front velocity, contractile deceleration point and distal latency. So each swallow, I'm not sure how I'm gonna get to do doing the animation. Anyway, each swallow, when you do, we use a strict protocol. I'll, I'll cover the protocol in a few minutes, but each swallow has to be evaluated independently. And you, the, the metrics that we, that we use, we've got to um, apply all, the, all these metrics to each swallow. So the first one we always look at, the most important metric is your IRP. That is your... Uh, integrated re relaxation pressure, and that is actually just to show how much relaxation there is of your of your um, of your lower esophageal sphincter when you swallow. Your DCI that is actually distal contractile integral, and that actually just shows the force of with what the contraction is 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 occurring. Um, Contractile deceleration point, that is just where the speed of your contraction slows down. And that is sort of coincides with when you do a gastroscopy where your ampulla is. Distal latency, that is the distance from where your upper sphincter relaxes in time up to your um, contractile deceleration point. And that has to be less than 4,5 centimeters. And that sort of indicates um, if there is a premature contraction or not. The last one, um, oops. <laughs> the last one is your contractile front velocity. They've sort of stopped using that, but I think it's still important because that is sort of the speed, um, it shows the speed of the, of the contraction. So I'll just sort of discuss each metric in, in, in more detail. So your integrated relaxation pressure is a 10 um, seconds um, period of time. And it starts where your upper sphincter starts to relax. And it takes four seconds and it's got, it measures the four pressures, the lowest pressures in, in four seconds over the 10 second period. So the, the seconds can be, the four seconds can be one, 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 or it can be two and two, or it can be, it can be continuous, like a total four seconds that are, sort of is the lowest pressure um, during re relaxation of your, of your lower sphincter when you swallow. The distal contractile integral, as I said, is, is the force of your contraction, how hard um, uh, the, the esophagus is actually working. And then I've sort of grouped the other two together. Again, as I said, the deceleration point is just where your contraction slows down. Your distal latency, as I said, is a, is a time period to see if it's less than 4,5, then you've got to do with a premature contraction. And the shorter the period of time, the, the more spastic your contraction becomes. Um, and as I said, the frontal contractile, frontal uh, velocity is not that important. So this working group then came up with a new protocol. So to sort of be able to use your Chicago uh, classification of the version four, they now decided they're going to have this new protocol. 
So the protocol using the version four, what's changed is they now want us to have two positions. They want a primary position. Um, the solid state people usually have the primary position in the upright. We, with the water perfused, have our primary position in the supine position. And then once you've done your, your well, what it consists of the, is that you have, uh, once you've settled the patient, once you've put your catheter in the right uh, position, then you have to wait three minutes for the patient to sort of, um, sort of get used to this catheter a run-in period, as we call it. Then we, we have three deep breaths so that we can see, you can see here, just to illustrate that you've crossed your OG junction. Then we go and we give 10 swallows of water, five mils each time, and there must be a period of about 20 to 30 seconds between each swallow. We then end the, 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 um, the protocol with um, what we call multiple rapid swallows. And that is just you give two mils at quite a fast speed for five two mil swallows. And then once you've done that, you've got to get the patient up in the, in the secondary position, have him sit up. And then we have again, just a running period, the three deep breaths. And sorry, I missed the, with the first one. You have a resting pressure of thit, uh, one minute, oh, sorry, 30 seconds. And then here in the secondary position, you only do five swallows, but you follow on your, your provocation sort of testing by giving the patient a free drink uh, of 200 mils, and he's going to drink it as fast as possible. So that is basically your basic uh, protocol uh, that you use. If you this new uh, protocol sort of feels if you don't get a motility disorder here, but the patient has got a symptom of some kind, especially dysphagia or chest pain, you're now sort of wanting to chase the symptom. So they've actually now added on to everything. So with each swallow, you sort of analyze according to your IRP. Um, and as I said, you've got to look at the vigor of your contraction, you've got to look at the pattern, as well as the intrabolus um, pressure of each, of each swallow. So what they've done is, according to these metrics, um, they've divided the motility disorders, according to the version 4, into two uh, groups. So we take our IRP as the most important um, metric. So if you've got an increased IRP, that insinuates that implies that you've got outflow obstruction and they've grouped your dysmotility of OGJ outflow together. So that is your achalasia type one, type two, and type three, as well of, as OGJ outflow obstruction. On the other hand, they've now done, they've now not, they don't talk about major or minor motility disorders. They now talk about absent contractility, distal esophageal spasm, hypercontractile esophagus and ineffective esophageal motility. So I'm going to first um, just show uh, examples of disorders of OGJ outflow. The whole thing about high resolution manometry is that they want you to sort of do pattern recognition um, that you can sort of eyeball and see what you think, think it is. So here we've got um, the typical picture that you will find with the classic achalasia. I just want to tell you that if you just get one slide like this, you, you, you can't actually make a diagnosis. You've got to sort of just explain or, or sort of describe what you see. So for instance, here, the IRP was, is more than 18. Um, in, in the water perfuse system, we use 18 as a value. It depends, solid state is usually slightly higher. And then it also differs between what make you use. Are you using a, a, a metronic system or a Labore system or uh, any other system? The, the values all differ slightly. So what you should say is that in, in this case, we've got an increased IRP, which uh, implies outflow obstruction, and we've got absent Con, um, contractions with normal uh, esophageal uh, intrabolus pressure. And if you have 10 of such swallows uh, that looks exactly the same, um, then we call it classic achalasia or type, type 1 achalasia. If you now do some imaging, um, you will see that type 1 has typically got a very dilated uh, esophagus on, on, um, on a barium swallow. 
um, and typically a, a kind of a bird beak um, that you can see. Then achalasia with compression or type two, typically, um, typically what you see is again increased IRP and absent contractions or failed uh, contractions, um, failed peristalsis, but you have this pan esophageal pressurization. So you've got a pressure, intrabolus pressure that stretches from your lower sphincter right up to your UES, and we use the isobaric contour line of 30. So it's very important. It's got to go from the bottom to the top. And also what you notice here is you can see that the, the, there's some shortening um, of the, of the um, esophagus and this lets the LOS sort of pull up. And typically in the linear um, um, tracings we had with, with conventional manometry, it was quite often falsely diagnosed that there is contraction because your little catheter would sit here. Oops. Um, your little con your contract your catheter would sit here and then the esophagus would pull up and then it looks like relaxation so that's where um, they found we actually now diag make a better diagnosis of achalasia with with high resolution manometry and actually we now find that you know where it used to be like one out of a hundred thousand we now see two out of a hundred thousand um, with a diagnosis of achalasia and again if you go to imaging um, you can see with your type 2, you don't have as uh, a dilated esophagus, but you have again the little bird beak or the rat tail that you can see here. Hmm. Spastic achalasia or type 3. Honestly, I've been in the trade for, it feels like to me forever, but I really, if, I, if I've seen one or two spastic achalasia or even just normal spasm, uh, it's really, really is very rare. And the only thing that you get is you still get um, uh, absent contractions or failed peristalsis, but you've got to have two out of the 10, 20% of spastic contractions um, that you see. And how it presents is you have the increased IRP, but your distal latency is less than 4,5. And you, what it looks like is like, uh, you can sort of, it looks like at the back, you've got a kind of a normal um, peristaltic contraction, but in front, you can see clearly, it looks like a kind of a straight line. Um, and if you see the barium swallow, it's typically a corkscrew image. If you, if you look at the gastroscopy, you can also see it looks like a typical oh. um, corkscrew. Um, OG junction outflow obstruction, all it means, it, it, quite often it's found um, as an as a, um, accidental finding when you do manometry for other reasons. Um, and it's got an increased IRP. In other words, your IRP is more than 18 in the water perfuse system. And you see a normal um, contraction, peristaltic contraction. So that's our first group. Then the second group is disorders of peristalsis. So here we can also get absent contractility. And again, I just want to remind you, you can't make the diagnosis on, on just one slide. You've got to see all 10 um, and they've all got to be failed or absent uh, contractions if you want to make uh, the diagnosis of absent contractility. The big difference between this not being an achalasia is that your IRP is not increased. So it has a normal IRP. In this case, for instance, it was, it was 11. Um, so images that can look like this is, it could be, you see it sometimes in um, scleroderma, sort of a, a advanced stage. You can see it in a treated um, achalasia and also in severe GERD patients, you can also find it. Uh, esophageal spasm, it's exactly like the, like the achalasia, the spastic achalasia, except that your IRP now is, is less than 18, but you still have a, a shortened distal latency time and this very straight kind of line with a kind of a normal peristaltic um, picture at, at, at the back. Hypercontractile esophagus is, is, is actually quite dramatic. Um, all it means is it's a normal peristaltic contraction, IRP that's below 18, and then it's just a very strong contraction. Um, 
And if you get two of these out of your 10 contractions or 10 swallows, we talk about a jackhammer esophagus. What you must be aware of is if you see something like this, you've always got to ask your patient if they're not using something with opoids, even coding, um, because opoids uh, can give you exactly this same picture. And if you stop the, ta the, the tablets for two weeks, then you'll have a normal contraction. They have now grouped in ineffective esophageal motility uh, as, as the fourth um, uh, motility disorder uh, or peristaltic disorder. And what they've done, they've made uh, IEM more stringent. So now you've got to have 70% uh, out of the 10 um, swallows has to be weak. And weak means you've got to have a DCI of between 100 and 450 um, millimeters of mercury. Um, and or um, fragmented uh, contractions. That just means in the 20 uh, isobaric contra, the gap, the gap here between your, your striated muscle and smooth has to be more than five centimeters. Um, or it can be 50% of failed contractions. So in other words, five of your 10 swallows must be failed. Then we call it ineffective uh, esophageal motility and quite often uh, found in conjunction with, with um, reflux disease. Provocation testing, uh, previously with the Chicago 3, um, th that was not included. Uh, now with the Chicago um, 4, as I said, the, the, the multi multiple rapid swallows is grouped with your primary position and your rapid drink challenge is grouped with your secondary position. And as I explained, it's just you give them two mils uh, five times, uh, sort of a second uh, in between. And what you want to see is the inhibitory effect that your lower sphincter relaxes totally and that you have a clearance contraction that is normal. And that gives you the idea of the peristaltic reserve. Very important if you're thinking of doing a fundoplication, because if that's, if that's not there, if it's, there's a poor peristaltic reserve, then you will change your fundoplication and, and, and just do uh, 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 a toupee or an anterior wrap. The rapid drink challenge, you actually have uh, 200 mils and you give them, they've got to drink it as fast as they can. And again, you want to see that the LOS is, is relaxing and you want the clearance contraction. And that is actually, if you, you're trying to demonstrate that there isn't an increased um, IRP, say you've got a patient with dysphagia and you're not getting your answers out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the primary uh, position of your, of your protocol, then you go on and you do this, this the, the secondary one, and you're looking for an increased IRP. Um, sorry, I just meant to mention you that also, uh, once you've done that and say you still don't get an answer, as I said, we chase the symptom, um, then we give them solid swallows, uh, in, in the secondary position and the, and the solid swallows uh, consists of a centimeter by a centimeter of bread, um, 10 of those that they've got to eat or a meal, which can be three slices of bread that you butter and the crusts are cut off or uh, a pie. English, well, typically they say the English pie that you get at H, um, in HS <laughs> cafeteria. Um, and that is again to see if you can't prove that there's an increased IRP or that your contractions change um, to try and explain the dysphagia or the chest pain. So what's also uh, been brought into the Chicago classification or has added on, uh, if you come, especially in, in your outflow obstruction group, if you, you still can't quite prove anything, um, but you've got an increased IRP, you're, you've got um, peristaltic contraction, well, not quite peristaltic, they can look um, fragmented or there can be remnants of contractions, or you just get the feeling they just don't look normal. Um, to now confirm the outflow obstruction, um, to see if there's holdup, you do, uh, we do non-manometric investigations and typically um, we do the time barium swallow and you, you do that, you, they, they have the bolus of barium and you, you measure the, the bolus um, of, oh, you measure the, um, oh. hmm, no, I've forgotten, no, no, the, you measure the, the, the column. 
the column, yeah, sorry, the column of barium at one minute, three minutes, and five minutes. Because if you find in the outflow obstruction uh, with not, you're not quite sure where to group it into, is it a, is it a achalasia um, developing or is it a variant? Um, if you've got a patient with severe dysphagia, you find an outflow obstruction plus this barium, and they've had weight loss with a severe symptom of dysphagia, then you will um, sort of offer the patient something definite like a pneumatic dilatation or, um, or, or a, a Heller's. Um, the other very interesting test is your end of flip that you can also do. Unfortunately, as far as I know, there's no one in South Africa that has a system like that. And it's typically also for your atypical achalasias or your outflow, OGJ, outflow obstructions that you can't label. And you can see clearly here, you've got sort of the nip waste. And, and, and once you've treated the, and well, that sort of demonstrates that the compliance of your OG junction is, is tight. The, the, the you know sort of what you would find in the achalasia and and then once you've treated them you can see how nicely it, it actually expands so indications for high resolution manometry uh, if you as a gastroenterologist want to request this um, you need to it's patients with dysphagia without obstruction so in other words you must have already done a gastroscopy to exclude that it's a cancer um, or a stenosis, people with uh, um, um, non-cardiac chest pain, you want to see if that's if there's not a motility disorder, pre-fundiplication, so very important because we so often get post-fundiplication uh, motility problems, then you do not know if that, uh, if that had been there before the time or not. And then placing of your pH probe, you can place it far more accurately if you know exactly where the upper border of your LOS is. And then also the extent of multi-system diseases like scleroderma, how much it's been um, affected. The take-home message, high-resolution manometry is really about pattern recognition and the metrics. Know your indications for asking the procedure, know the three types of achalasia and the most appropriate treatment, and one size does not fit all. So you've got to individualize, well, it can take it as far as each swallow, but also each patient and their, and their symptoms and your findings of your, of your, after you've done your protocol. Um, these are some interesting um, articles that you can read. And then, well, hopefully you've got more clarification than confusion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sasa. That's a, a tour through manometry. And uh, I think it was a very good tour. I learned, uh, as usual, when I listen to Sasa, I learn little tidbits here and there. Um, uh, definitely uh, worth um, uh, the, the effort that you put in. So there are some questions here. One, one let me start with um, is, can you clarify the difference between pH testing and impedance and manometry? Oh, That's the okay. first one. Shame. Okay. Manometry is a function test of the esophagus. We actually, um, we do get uh, impedance um, high resolution manometry as well. So impedance is measured in resistance. Um, whereas high resolution manometry is in pressure and time. pH um, impedance, pH measures your, your reflux episodes. So in other words, it is to confirm, um, it's, it's a different catheter that you use and the patient goes home with this little impedance, pH impedance catheter and it stays in for 24 hours. So we look at the acid reflux episodes, but because we measure resistance, we can actually now, exactly see if it's a reflux episode or is it is it a, a swallow is the is the reflux episode is it a, a or non if it's food or two different tests one is for motility and function of the esophagus the other one is to confirm good or to confirm a symptom association Thanks, thanks for that. One of the other questions is with these dilated esophaguses, how can you be sure that your catheter actually goes into the stomach? And if you aren't sure, what do you do? 
Okay, that, 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 yes. Um, we sometimes, if the OGJ is so tight, if that sphincter is so tight, um, you can struggle to get through it. So that's why you may, you sort of do the deep breathing because then you can sort of very clearly, if you, if you take a deep breath, the pressure drops, it goes more negative in the esophagus and more positive in the abdomen. So you can clearly, you also can see the um, diaphragm, it sort of uh, gets accentuated. So you can clearly see where your little diaphragm is, and then you can see the lower pressure, it's a lighter, uh, a deeper blue in the esophagus side and uh, sort of more yellow color in the, in the abdominal side. So that's how you know you've crossed. And then we also make, uh, uh, use the, so you can actually set, there's a, a tool on our, our system that you can actually set and bring it up and you can see when your um, uh, tracing has a positive uh, deviation until you cross your OGJ, then it becomes negative. So you've got two ways of making sure. And, and if you're unsure still after all those, do you, do you ever place it with endoscopy? And if you do do that, do you sedate them? <laughs> yes, well, we've done like one or two, Gully and I have done one or two, and that's where we couldn't cross the OTJ. You can very clearly see when you don't cross. Um, and, 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 and it was in one case, I know the one lady, she, it was really difficult and we had, we, to, to make the diagnosis of achalasia, and we really had to do the manometry. So we sedated her, we did a, in, in, in the, you know, Gallia did a gastroscopy and then we, we sort of had a guide why and we managed to do it and I would just do the manometry there. So, but we don't do that often. Yes, maybe perhaps I can ask a question of all those, perhaps those who are both in South Africa, but, but around the continent. How many of you, if you could use your, your mm -hmm. reaction and put your hand up if you have access to manometry or if you, if you have access to manometry, could you all do that if you have uh, access to manometry? Because obviously, um, even for us in South Africa, there are there's limited access to some degree. There's a few hands going up here and there. Yeah, I think it, it may be a tool that's that's used largely in the in South Africa. And so the, the next question would be, how do you expand the training into Africa for this? If it uh, for obviously first you have to have the equipment. It's a bit like endoscopy, except it's even rarer than hen's teeth. You're asking me that? Yes, why not you? <laughs> You've, you've dedicated your life to it and you've trained quite a few people to do it in South Africa, haven't you? Okay, so, so, so uh, I think the first thing is you, you, you must want to do it, you know, you must have interest. Um, and then the only way that I feel that you really learn is you've got to go and do a basic course somewhere. Like, for instance, I did a basic course in Singapore um, and then come back and then spending time in labs um, wherever. I was fortunate enough to be in, I spent time in Leuven, uh, a lot of time in, in, in Zurich and, um, and Bath and London. So that's the only way is, is to actually um, go and watch some people and then start uh, doing it on your own. And it's, it's always very nice if you've got a mentor. I, I had uh, wonderful mentors and I could send my cases to them and they would analyze and give me advice. And then uh, what we do, we have about three or four webinars, um, uh, sort of uh, with with uh, sort of the interest group people in Amsterdam, and that helps a lot. You present cases, and then they criticize you or help you come to a conclusion. That's yes, I think yeah, that, that's fantastic, Chris. I think there is a tendency just to think that it's a technical procedure, especially yeah. with the with the. Um, you know, the solid state that you can get a report and base your judgment on that. But you do need skilled technicians and, and experienced yeah. individuals to to. Yeah. So I think it, it is a it is a discipline once you've you can master the actual technique of doing it that would lend itself to exactly how you've developed it in South Africa. So so well done there. And, and hopefully that would be a model for for others. 
And the problem is, you know, with a uh, version three, um, I, and it's interesting in Europe, uh, the Zurich and Bath people, they, they actually do, um, the gastroenterologists, they do the study themselves. And I think mm. you get a lot of information if you do it, just how the patient reacts. So that's important that you do the test physically. And the Chicago three, if you, if the patient came in and you took the history, by the time they walk out, it's about an hour, you know, and then you, and you analyze. So, but now the Chicago four, it's made it much longer. So that's why I think we're going to probably see a change again in the near future, I hope. Okay. Thank you very much, Sasa. I think uh, now we know how to diagnose achalasia, we're going to find out how to manage it. Over to you, Galia. Thanks. If you can share your screen and Thank inform you. us. Thanks, Prof. One second, please. Right. Can you see that nicely, Prof? We can. Yes. Very good. Okay, Loud and great. clear. Right. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, as you've all heard, I sit in a very fortunate position in that I work in a unit with an expert. Um, with, without that backup, um, whatever I offer is pretty substandard, so I'm very fortunate. So to take you through very briefly um, as regards the management of, of the achalasias, I think, you know, we have to really appreciate that... Um, all therapeutic interventions are actually palliative. And I think it's unfair to give the patients um, an, a not a realistic expectation of their disease. So take them through it. It really pays off to, to chat through to them, make sure they understand rather than just going doing your procedure and then they don't understand why they're not completely symptom free. Um, so very briefly, pharmacological options, I think that's not even really worthwhile talking about. I don't think there's much use in that. Botox specifically, um, in my mind, Botox has three main indications. Firstly, I think as a treatment option in a patient not fit for any other intervention. Um, and the literature mentions if you have a life expectancy of approximately two years, then you justified honestly in doing repeated um, Botox. It's also then cost effective. For us, in addition, we would consider Botox occasionally um, to use it as an aid to diagnose in a patient with a difficult interpretation of the immunometry. Or alternatively, we've used it to tide someone over until they're able to have a more definitive procedure. I think you must appreciate that repeatedly Botoxing someone is really not a great idea in that the resultant fibrosis does make further procedures more tricky. It's not difficult to do, really, it isn't. Um, you mix up your Botox 100 units um, into two mils, and then you inject 0.5 mils, so that's 25 unit um, increments into the lower esophageal sphincter into four quadrants. I leave you only with one tip here. If you are seeing a bleb of mucosal lifting, you are way too superficial and you're wasting your Botox. You really need to be in the deeper muscle with your needle. So that's the one thing there. Um, as regards achalasia type, I think one and two will generally do well irrespective of, of your type of intervention you choose. Um, but as Sasa said, type three, that's sort of the rare one that we see once or twice a year. Um, and in that case, I really do think there's enough evidence to say a longer myotomy is probably going to be useful there, is specifically regarding their chest spasms. So here I would do a poem. Um, let's, however, quickly talk first about pneumatic balloon dilatations. I think this is a very effective um, strategy if it's performed properly and with a graded approach. I think sadly what we see is happening too often is that patients get one dilatation with a 30 mil balloon and off they go into the sunset. Um, now that's not good. So the only way to give good long-term outcomes um, with a balloon is to give a proper graded approach. And that, that includes a routine second dilatation at a defined interval and possibly even a third if they're still symptomatic. 
Um, you shouldn't always start with a 30 and then you work your way up. Don't jump straight to the larger one because you think you're going to be quick about it. Um, that really does result in a significant amount of perforations. So for those of you that can, I hope that projects that image, but the trick is such that you should be inflating the balloon with a waist in the middle of it. Um, and you inflate, inflate until you see the waist disappear. Don't go any further than that. Um, I must be very honest, I personally find pneumatic balloon dilatations um, in achalasia quite terrifying in that I, I don't, I'm not fond of having zero control over how these fibers are actually torn apart. So I must admit, maybe it's a personality thing or whatever, but I have a very big bias in favor of a surgical or endoscopic myotomy purely for that control aspect. However, um, let's be honest, in the hands of experts, pneumatic balloon dilatations are super effective. Um, and those of you with an interest in achalasia, you'll be familiar with this landmark RCT from 2011, um, New, Engle New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I confess it was a shock to my delicate surgical heart. Were the physicians with their balloons actually better than us? Um, yes, and a two-year follow-up, your graded balloon dilatations were actually comparable to a laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. However, thankfully, there's always a but. Um, so two messages as regards balloons. There are a subgroup of patients who will probably not do that well with dilatations. And for this, I think you should remember that it's younger patients, males, those with very high IRPs on your manometry, those with pre-existing chest pain, um, or having much esophageal dilatation or significant delays on their barium imaging have, that they've had done. And secondly, the other good news for us is that as time continues, um, these patients do that have had balloons do tend to start representing with recurrent symptoms. So thankfully, our surgical procedures are not quite ready for the dustbin yet. So um, I'd like to take you through a couple of things I like to do for a laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. Everyone's got their own technique. Um, and there are obviously different ways to approach it. Sorry about that. Um, so firstly, my camera port, which is this one here. Um, that must really be not more than a hand's breadth below the ziffy, where you actually might end up too far from the distal esophagus for an adequate um, dissection. And then the other thing is my right working port is always a 10 millimeter. Um, and I like that in that I can pop some Ratex swabs down to, to swab away the blood from the myotomy, as I'm really not a fan of having a suction anywhere near this exposed myotomy. So um, good exposure with adequate elevation of the left hemi liver is obviously completely essential. That's the first thing. Um, I'm going to ask you to try and avoid too much mobilization. Expose really only the anterior surface adequately of the distal esophagus and OGJ. I never mobilize posteriorly. Um, using energy devices for the myotomy, in my opinion, is super brave. Um, I think if you accidentally touch something with a, with a hook diathermy on that very flimsy mucosa, you're going to have a hole by tomorrow morning. So um, I always prefer tearing the muscle apart with blunt dissection. I use two Marylands. It, yes, of course, it does bleed a little bit more, um, but at least I have that security that there shouldn't be a delayed per perforation tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed this. That's just a vagus nerve that we're trying to preserve there. So um, as regards the myotomy length, I do measure it roughly against an instrument once we're done. Um, but this is really, you have to appreciate, not an accurate technique. So what is better? Um, we tend to perform an intra-op gastroscopy on all our hellers. And you can see here that the insufflation is starting to create a bulging out of that mm -hmm. mucosa. Um, and the idea is obviously, yes, to look for leaks, but also super useful to accurately determine your myotomy length. So here you can see um, that same patient. And one of the nice things about doing a scope 
when you're using your insufflation, um, we tend to place the patient head down. We pour some saline over the myotomy and on that insufflation, you should hopefully not see any bubbles. If you do, well, that's not a good sign. You can also appreciate as the light moves forward just how jolly thin that mucosa is. You can see the little capillaries there. Um, in addition, when you're going down with your scope and you don't see any intraluminal blood, that's also quite um, reassuring. Um, I'm also aware of people in liking to put down a methylene blue um, solution down a previously placed nasogastric tube. And if you see some blue laparoscopically, well, again, that's also a bit scary. I must say I prefer a scope. Um, I hope this projects, but you can see there um, the laparoscopic light shining now from the inside as you're intraluminal, and it defines the myotomy distally quite nicely, and then as well as proximally to the Z line. So you can see we're there roughly at the Z line now, and to me this is such a useful technique to adequately assess the length of the myotomy that you've done. Um, both proximally and distally. So I like this because, yes, it looks for a leak, um, but fantastic way to check that the myotomy length is adequate. Okay, so the next question is, um, do you fundoplicate or not? So personally, I think this is one of the advantages of a helis. So yes, if I'm doing a helis, I would offer an anterior partial fundoplication. And in this procedure, I think the actual angle of his augmentation, that's the most important step. Um, we'll get to that just now. What is counterproductive to me, honestly, and this is my personal opinion, is a posterior wrap. In my mind, the less mobilization of the anatomy comprising the natural anti-reflux barrier, the better. So I'm really not a fan of a toupee for an achalasia. Um, in addition to that, I think you are super brave if you're performing a full wrap. So in this one, I would always only do a partial anterior. That said and done, these authors actually polled surgeons who do helis quite uh, frequently. And from this, you can see that despite my personal misgivings, almost 20% um, of people are actually doing a nissen. So I find that that's quite brave. Um, the other thing you can do is the option of performing um, what is termed a limited laparoscopic helis myotomy with an angle of his augmentation um, and nicely demonstrated um, that this is actually comparable to an anterior door. Um, I do like this concept quite nicely. Uh, it works quite nicely. So basically what you're doing, you're taking the fundus and tacking it to the um, left um, side of your um, crust and myotomy that you've opened up. And this is, an, this is an approach we do quite frequently. With an adequate myotomy um, on your routine day one post-operative swallow, you should see much improved flow. So you can see the flow coming across nicely. Your um, dilatation is markedly decreased in this case. So you know that you've done a fairly fairly good myotomy in this case. Let's quickly talk about poems. Um, the trick here is to measure where your lower esophageal sphincter is as your, as your first um, step. And then you move your scope up. So you first measure where it is, and then you move your scope up 12 centimeters approximately, and that's where you're gonna create your mucosal entry point. And then you create your tunnel between the mucosa and your muscle layers, either laterally or posteriorly, sorry. And your aim is really, really to try and avoid at all costs rotating around the esophagus, because the last place you want to end up accidentally is in the area of the angle of his. That's a bit of a mess. So first step is to lift the mucosa with saline and methylene blue solution. And the idea is obviously to create a pillow um, that lifts up your mucosa so that you can safely um, create a mucosal entry point. And I like to use a triangle tip knife, although there's different options. And I'm just going to show you some short snippets of the procedure, otherwise you'll all fall asleep. And um, the one thing you do need is spray coagulation to create this tunnel. And I recommend that you stay super close to the muscle side. And that's for safety, so that you don't um, accidentally injure mucosa with your hot instrument. And you can see us there just buzzing through a, small, through a small vessel. And these are obviously what you see here, the circular muscle fibers. 
With poems, um, there's much effort made to perform a selective circular martomy. Um, you can see us picking it up here, and the idea is to preserve the longitudinal layers. I do hope you could see those two layers. It was a bit quick. Um, however, most of the, not most, many of the poems I do will be following previous balloons or other procedures, hellers or whatever. And in this case, the associated fibrosis may actually play a role in the, in the problem. So here you will see us, let me just show you again. Um, here you'll see us actually performing a full thickness myotomy. Um, so in redos, I confess, I never even try and spare the longitudinal fibers. We just go straight and do a full thickness myotomy. What you see here is a completed myotomy and tunnel. So at nine o'clock, the mucosal border bulging into the, into the view. And then the full thickness muscle myotomy edges at sort of one and six o'clock. And then you pop back through your entry point and into the um, native lumen. And hopefully what you should see as you follow the blue blanching down towards the OGJ that your junction now opens much nicer. Now the closure is obviously rather important. So um, during this longitudinal closure of the entry point, I've got two tips for you. Your initial apex clip must be just prox um, to approximate the edges must be um, really well placed. You should place it distal to the actual defect, not quite like in the picture here. Um, I'll show you a photo in a sec. And the idea is that it brings a, um, an easier and more stress-free closure of those two edges um, by placing that one clip just beneath. And then always, always start distally with your closure and you work yourself um, up towards yourself. I like to use rotatable clips here with a good strength to them, long arms, which open widely. Um, and you obviously want to get a nice, good, strong bite of tissue. So here, that first apex clip, you can see just below the incision, and that aims to allow easier approximation of those edges. As you can see here, if you work towards yourself, you are really able to see very nicely what remains to be closed. And you can imagine this is absolutely impossible if you're starting the other way um, and are moving proximally. Then here, the completed closure. Um, depends how big your hole was, but generally sort of five to six clips is usually enough. Factors that clip manufacturers are really judged upon are the following, um, the rotatability, the overshooting with rotation, your precision of the opening and closing of the actual clip, the strength of it once it's closed, and the strength of the, ten of the tissue compression. My addition to this list is that um, the ease of release of the clip from the actual delivery devices is really important. Obviously the cost plays a role um, and equally important the ability to adjust your clip by opening and closing it repeatedly um, as you change the position and want to get a better bite or whatever. Um, and I say this because some of the very cheapest clips that are available are absolute rubbish because they only open and close once and then you can't adjust them at all. So that, that shouldn't even be sold in my opinion. The other important things are the width. Um, the wider, obviously, the better the amount of tissue that you can actually grasp. Whatever clips you decided to use on completion, you should really be able to safely pass over and beyond your closures for a final check or a second look um, without any concerns of knocking any of your clips off. They are pretty sturdy if they are applied properly, so it shouldn't be a problem to go over, over and um, check again and again. So they, if they knock off, then you didn't apply them properly in the first place. Um, finally, as regards clips, the vast majority of mucosal clips will eventually fall off. Um, here's proof, however, that they don't rust, as they tell us. Um, this is the only clip I've, still, uh, I've seen still in situ almost two years after one of our poems. Everybody else, you don't see anything. Sometimes you see a little bit of scarring. So that brings me to the next um, important thing. How long should your myotomy be? So a couple of points in general. The distal gastric myotomy length is the issue, really. Um, Olschlager et al. in 2008. 2003 published that a two to three centimeter gastric myotomy sort of gave you the optimal outcome as regards dysphagia relief when you did a Hellers. 
Now we all know that the further down you divide the muscle on the stomach side, the thinner those tissues get and the higher the chance of your perforations occurring. So the question is actually, what is the safest yet most effective length of myotomy? So this is quite interesting. Um, Title Bone et al, they looked at the distensibility during various stages of a poem using an endoflip. You'll see even just by um, the anesthetic induction and just by creating your tunnel is already improved um, distensibility. But um, what I want you to focus on is here, the one to two to three centimeter distal myotomy. What you see quite nicely from the results is that once you divide beyond two centimeters from your Z line, there's really not much increase in distensibility. So there's not much benefit going over two centimeters as regards this length. Um, and in addition, as the tissue gets thinner, this is where your perforations will occur. So I think a myotomy over two centimeters probably doesn't um, have any additional big benefit, but does have more complications. So how do you decide you've actually done a good job as regards your myotomy? So different ways, none of them perfect. And you should probably be using a combination. The first thing is some people pop down a little uh, spot of ink, tattooing. I've never done that. What you can note um, is that as you go down the stenotic segment of tunnel at the OG junction, it's suddenly followed by a, re by a release of space available. That's quite um, easy to see. There's also a definitive change in the submucosal vascular pattern from palisade to reticular. I also repeatedly withdraw the scope into the esophagus and you confirm your orientation. And then that blue blanching of the mucosa as you improve, improve the length of your tunnel is, is quite nice to see as well. Measuring the myotomy length is a waste of time. Um, it really is most inaccurate. What is really, I think, probably the way to go, which is not that easy to do, is the two scope technique. Um, perhaps you can see here. So the two scope or double scope technique is, is to essentially confirm your length by visualization of the light that is in the tunnel. Um, it's a bit of a fiddle getting a second small scope um, to retroflex and see that light your initial scope is, is giving you in the tunnel. But what you can do is you could borrow the bronchoscope from your anesthetist instead. Um, that works pretty well as well. The other thing is um, over 90% of patients have two penetrating vessels, which penetrate through the circular muscle along the edge of the oblique muscle um, at the level of the cardia. So if you can see there your blue arrows, um, I hope you can see that those fibers are actually um, the oblique fibers and the green arrows are showing you the vessels and extending your myotomy up to the second penetrating vessel is also deemed an indication that you've actually done an adequate length of your distal myotomy. So um, again, for the poems, we'd also do a routine post-op swallow and you wanna check specifically that where you put your clips, there's no leak. So what about a comparison, which is better, Heller's or poem? I don't think there's an answer to that at the moment. The most recent comparisons reported over 90% effectivity um, as regards dysphagia in both, but there is a distinct increase in reflux in poems. We know that as confirmed again and again. Um, what about the outcomes between the subtypes? Similar in both, except for a type three, where, as we said earlier, we'd consider a poem because of that um, benefit of the extended myotomy. What about pediatrics? Now that's a group where both procedures are technically possible. And um, this is my, my opinion now. In children, I would probably always prefer Heller's in that you can add the fund application um, because in a child, the potential of chronic reflux, that to me is a little bit, yeah, I'm not sure if I'd be happy with a poem in that situation. What about leaks specifically? I think of interest, you know, the the that to me is quite high. That doesn't quite fit in with what, what our experience is. But I think what's important, the late um, leaks are very similar in both groups. So yeah. What about reflux? As we said, poems without a doubt more likely to experience reflux. Um, they have more erosive gastritis. And this reflux and this gourd is evidenced by pH monitoring. 
even with an anterior wrap, you will still have a significant percentage with abnormal acid exposure. So be realistic with your patients. Even if you do a nice door, um, they may still land up on chronic PPIs. The learning curve uh, for Hellas, if you're quite comfortable laparoscopically, should be about 15, 16 cases. With a POEM, if you're an experienced interventional endoscopist, about 13. If you're like the rest of us, um, it's going to take 40 to 60. As regards the out outcomes, um, obviously POEMs are usually, you can imagine they're back on the go a bit faster, but interestingly, the costs between the two are exactly the same. Um, redos, I do find specifically very difficult with the hellers um, due to the, the, that intense fibrosis and that really frightening proximity of a very thin underlying mucosa. So for redos, a poem uh, is definitely my, my procedure of choice. So is a poem superior? I think for certain situations, a poem or hellers may be superior to the other. But I think overall, it's really far too early to make such a statement. And I don't think we'll be able to in that I'm not sure a long RCT will ever be approved. So we're still waiting to see. Um, but this is one of the more recent um, uh, case control um, studies. And again, uh, confirming that the procedures are similar as regards dysphagia relief. And reflux is obviously the only big difference. A quick word about sigmoid esophagus. I think um, this deserves a quick mention in that for most of us, this is something we see not infrequently. And while I think the term end stage achalasia suggests an esophagectomy, we in our unit would always first offer a salvage myotomy. Um, as regards a poem in this setting, it's a relative contraindication. You know, even once you've cleaned up this esophageal lumen with all that uh, muck that's sitting about there, the, the tortuosity and angulation of that OGJ can me make it incredibly tricky to do a poem. Um, so I wouldn't personally attempt it, but obviously the experts um, do so very, very comfortably. So this was published one or two months ago, um, and it basically confirms um, our practice in that it is really worthwhile to consider uh, performing a salvage myotomy first via a, a helis. So give your patient the chance to keep that sigmoid esophagus a little bit longer. Here's someone we did um, quite recently. And what you'll see here on the left pre helis um, and then they're on the right post helis. So while there's still some holdup, you can see that there is better flow and there is marked less, dis less distension, but more importantly, um, in the three months since this procedure, our patients now gained three kilograms of weight. So we'll see where this goes. Um, you might still have to do an esophagectomy at some point in the future. So just to finish off, um, I think here at Grotesque, we are very fortunate in that we are able to offer both procedures and we have a fantastic um, um, esophageal motility unit with SASA um, supporting us. And I do think this allows one to individualize better rather than making the patient fit the procedure, we find a procedure that suits a patient. So just to um, individualize my personal preference for revisions, I always do a poem. For a sigmoid esophagus, we do a helens. For a patient with a um, simultaneous hiatus hernia, we do a helens and a wrap. For type three, we'll always offer a poem. Younger patients, a helens. And then obviously you always need to consider patient preference. Thank you for your time. Daria, thanks very much. That was great. Um, I think we, you went through all the options there. And um, I think one of the other um, aspects of it is, you know, whether or not this type of treatment should be centralized and kept in the hands of uh, a few people who are doing, doing a lot. Your own experience now is how many? Roughly, uh, poems and, and hellers? Just both? Um, just... We do sort of one poem to two or three hellers. And I think we're sitting at just over 60, 65 poems. I must be honest, the last 18 months with COVID, I don't know what's happened to our achalasias. They've just yeah, yeah. got into the woodwork. 
Yeah, we've only done, we've done a couple of healers and um, the last poem I did was last year. So, yeah. And um, I mean, most of the comparisons have been done with um, hellers and um, poems, but what about the balloon against these, these two? Is it still, um, do you think it's a secondary treatment now or is it still up there? As regards, uh, regarding balloon and poem, I think as regards this phager relief, um, the literature will support that a poem wins there. Um, I think initially they might well be comparable, but I think there's enough to say that once you sort of hit two to five years, that the balloons start tending to come back. Okay, are there any, I don't see any other, other questions in, in the chat uh, here. One of the other, um, aspects we, you didn't talk about was exactly the kit that you need and that you do need a, a CO2 insufflator to do these, uh, these procedures. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We did the first couple without um, CO2 and just with air insufflation and gosh, they, they looked like little marshmallow men afterwards. And it's quite difficult to explain to your patient why they've got a giant big scrotum after an esophageal procedure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, since we've swapped to, swapped to CO2 insufflation, that's um, a thing of the past. So that's an essential thing. Um, you do need some specific instrumentation for sure. Um, and you, this is not something I would ever start by myself. Um, you do, as Sasa said with her stuff, you, you need to go somewhere and be mentored um, a little bit. Uh, this, this is, I still find it quite a scary procedure. I must be honest. Thanks very much. I think. Um... If I, I don't see anybody, Ed, I don't sure if you're you're still with us. Um, if you want to just uh, wind up for us, um, for for the next. Uh, are you yeah. there, Ed? I'm yeah. here. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, we we just. Uh, I'm just not quite sure. I don't think I got the correspondence about what a meeting is on next week. Um, I think it's I, IBD is up next. I think for the IBD meeting. Yeah, but. Uh, Again, just uh, to thank um, the ECHO uh, people from uh, from New Mexico, and then also our sponsors, uh, Takeda, Aspen, Asino, Adcock, Ingram, Amgen, and Equity. And uh, thank you also for the for the participants, and also for Cheryl and her team that always so nice to put these meetings together. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Galia. Thank you, Sasa. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, thanks to all, and I hope you enjoyed it. It, it sort of, um, it's a, certainly a, a topic that that uh, it's good to know about. Take care. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.